development of the practice of opening letters, noting the contents and then sending them on to their destinations. In order to retain the postal monopoly, the House of Fern and Taxiers offered to place the emperor in possession of the information derived from the so-called secret manipulation of letters. If, therefore, one were on good terms with the house one could easily and swiftly obtain news, and also dispatch it. In the course of time Mayor Amel had come to realize that it is of the greatest importance to the banker and merchant to have early and accurate information of important events, especially in time of war. As his native town was the headquarters of the Postal and Information Service, he had had the foresight to get into touch with the House of Fern and Taxes, and had transacted various financial matters to their great satisfaction. It was on this fact that he relied when he appealed to the fountainhead of the Imperial Postal Service at Frankfurt, His Imperial Majesty himself. In a petition to His Majesty that he and his sons should be granted the title of Crown Agent, Mayor Amel brought forward precisely those matters from which he had derived the greatest profit, namely, his financial and commercial transactions in the war against France, and the services which he had rendered to the House of Thurn and Taxes. He had been honest and punctual in his business dealings, as those witnesses would testify who endorsed his petition. The Roman German Emperor, whose power at this time was practically limited to the granting of honours, did actually consent to grant Mayor Amel the title of Imperial Crown Agent by a patent dated January 29, 1800. Not only was this a passport to him throughout the whole of the Roman Empire in Germany, it also carried the right to bear arms, and liberated him from several of the taxes and obligations laid upon the Jews of that period. The patent and the title were signed and granted by Francis II, simply as Roman German Emperor, and had nothing to do with Austria or Austrian government departments. It was not until much later that the brothers Rothschild entered into actual relations with Austria and her statesmen. Even as late as 1795, when the Landgrave of Hesse lent the Emperor Francis a million gulden, and in 1798 when he lent him an additional half million, other bankers conducted the transaction, the Rothschilds having nothing whatever to do with it. The dispensations enumerated in the imperial patent were more or less paper ones, since most of the smaller or greater territorial princes, of whom there was such a plenitude in Germany in 1800, applied their own laws and regulations. This, however, was a minor consideration with Mayor Amol. The important point was that the new title Imperial Crown Agent sounded much better than Hessian Landraviate, and was likely to attract a number of other titles. Prince von Essenberg and the German Order of Street. John both conferred upon him court titles in recognition of loans of money from the Principality, negotiated by Mayor Amol. In 1804 Rothschild requested the Prince of Fern and Taxes to bestow a similar favour upon one of his sons, in view of the fact that he himself bore the title of Imperial Crown Agent. It was characteristic that when asking the Emperor for a title he should mention the services rendered to the House of Taxes, and that when he applied for a favour to that house he should have based his claim on the fact that his services had been recognised by the Emperor. Such promotions were necessarily of service to him too, in his relations with his old patron the Landgrave of Hesse, who in spite of everything was still inclined to be suspicious. William of Hesse was in every way a most important person to Mayor Amel, for he was colossally rich, richer than the Emperor himself, and, a much more important point in those days than now, he was close at hand. Moreover, he had family ties with England, where Nathan was living, and with chronically penurious Denmark, by lending money to which the firm of Riepel and Hania, as well as that of Bethman, had made great profits. Mayor Amel advised the Landgrave to participate in this loan by buying stock. He did purchase a small amount, Rothschild being commissioned to carry through the transaction. This was done to the Landgrave's satisfaction. But Mayor Amel required a considerable sum of ready money in order to take advantage of a favourable opportunity for purchasing goods and bills of exchange. Knowing that the Landgrave, whose investments in England as well as in Germany brought in very good returns, had spare cash available, he asked, and obtained from him on two occasions, in November, 1801, and July, 1802. 160,000 thalers and 200,000 gulden as a guaranteed loan the securities being Danish and Frankfurt debentures. Although the security offered was exceptionally good, 
William of Hesse was persuaded to lend the money only after pressure had been brought to bear, and on the special recommendation of his principal financial administrator Buderus. The transaction certainly marked a distinct advance in Rothschild's confidential relations with the Landgrave. The second man was wanted, not merely for Mayor Emil himself, but also to assist his two eldest sons, who were already beginning to acquire the titles of court appointments wherever they could. As early as 1801 they were appointed official agents for making war payments on behalf of the state of Hesse. Mayor Emil had been enviously observing Rupel and Harnia's financial transactions with Denmark. It was his ambition to do similar business with Denmark, with Landraviate monies, on his own account, independently of any other firm. He still lacked any large capital sum, such as others had available, but he was accurately informed by Buderus of the large amount of ready money in the possession of the ruler of Hesse, which was seeking investment. He was determined to put his competitors out of the field by offering the prince better terms. The Frankfurt firms were accustomed to wait until orders came to them, but he meant to get in and negotiate personally. He had put through the secured loans at Kassel personally. And he decided to go there again in order to secure the cooperation of William's councillors with Buderus at their head, so that they might make the Landgrave disinclined to negotiate direct with Denmark. An important point was that Denmark was not to know where the money came from, because William did not with the be regarded as wealthy in his family circle, as he was afraid that some of them might ask for special favours, for this reason it was decided that a go-between who had relations with Buderus, and through him with Rothschild too, and who lived in Hamburg, which was conveniently near to Denmark, and far enough away from Hesse to allay suspicion, should be the first person to make approaches to that country. This was a Jewish banker called Laureates. Moreover, on Rothschild's own suggestion, and contrary to the usual practice, the loan was to run over a long period. Notice for repayment was not to be given for ten years or more, and after that period payment could be demanded only in quite small installments, over a period of twenty or thirty years. They did actually succeed in securing William of Hesse's consent to granting such a loan. And no sooner were the conditions agreed than Loyettes showed his hand to the extent of making the interest payable to Mayor Emil Rothschild at Frankfurt. The lender, the Hamburg banker wrote to Denmark, is an exceedingly rich capitalist, and exceptionally friendly to the Danish court. It is possible that even greater sums and better conditions may be obtainable from him. It is true that Loyettes did not know Rothschild personally at this time. The successful conclusion in September. 1803, of this, the first loan which he had carried through privately, not only brought Mayor Emil financial profit, but also resulted in his obtaining the title of Crown Agent of the Court of Hesse. His rivals had been highly displeased to hear of this loan, and kept making representations of a nature calculated to damage Rothschild, to the Landgrave. Rupel and Harnia were particularly assiduous. They drew attention to the fact that the last Danish loan had been issued in the form of debentures, in the name of Rothschild. And in order to rouse Danish national vanity they stressed the idea that this suggested that it was not the national credit of Denmark but merely the Jewish name of Rothschild that had got these obligations accepted in Hesse. Rothschild's fight with his rivals involved the officials entrusted with the financial administration of the land graviate in the struggle. Buderus became increasingly a partisan of Rothschild, whereas length of the war office took the side of Rippel and Harnia. Rothschild and Buderus, however, had the upper hand for the time being, and by 1806 no less than seven Landraviate loans were issued. The profit realized from this transaction served to key up still further the hatred and enmity of the rival firms and of Lemp, and led to awkward developments. Rothschild had shown the greatest energy in these undertakings. He did not even spare himself the journey to Hamburg, an exceedingly difficult one at that time, in order to get into personal touch with the banker, Laureates, and to see that the Danish business was carried on as energetically as possible. A letter from the Hamburg banker to Buderus contains the following statement, The Crown Agent Rothschild is coming to see me tomorrow in order to settle up our remaining accounts, and he intends to return the day after. It has been a pleasure to me to make the acquaintance of this man, and I shall be glad to be able to do him any service in future. The intrigues of the rivals, 
however, did not wholly fail of their effect upon William of Hesse. His attitude continued to be suspicious, and he several times refused to have anything to do with other business propositions suggested by Rothschild, agreeing to them only as the result of much pleading and persuasion. Besides the Danish loans, loans were issued for Hesse Darmstadt in the order of St. John, these also being subscribed by Landgraviate funds through the intermediary of Rothschild. The sums involved were already considerable, running into hundreds of thousands. The larger they were, the better pleased was Mayor Amel, because his percentage profit rose in proportion, while the risk was borne, not by him but by the Landgrave, whose favorite occupation had always been the careful administration and development of his property. The sums invested in England called for particular attention. Since the Peace of Basel, relations between Hesse and England had been rather strained, although they were not likely to become critical, as the Landgrave had cleverly succeeded in enlisting the interests of responsible people on his side. He had lent the Prince of Wales, afterwards King George IV, about £200,000 in two instalments. The Dukes of York and Clarence were guarantors of this loan, but they also borrowed money from the Landgrave. In addition to this, William of Hesse had put out £640,000 at interest in London in various ways, a fact which was to prove exceedingly useful to him. The example of their patron was a lesson to the House of Rothschild, and they soon learned to copy his wise practice of lending money by preference to persons in the highest position. Even though William of Hesse remained neutral in the Second War of the Coalition, he secretly wished success to the enemies of France for he eagerly hoped for the resumption of his profitable subsidy contracts with England. The Peace of Luneville, which extended France's boundaries to the Rhine, also conferred on William the dignity of elector, which he had so much desired, and which was duly proclaimed in 1803. But the meteoric rise of Bonaparte and revolutionary France's position in the world seemed to him to be unnatural and menacing. His friendship with Prussia was rather shattered, because that state had succeeded in annexing considerable territory, but had left the Hessian prince in the cold. The peace between France and England did not last long. As early as May, 1803, the island kingdom again declared war upon the usurper in Paris. It was not long before William of Hesse was forced to take an attitude toward the New World situation. In October, 1803, the French, having invaded English Hanover, tried to get money from the elector in exchange for Hanoverian territory. His fear of offending England caused him to refuse this offer, and thus the elector first gave offence to the Corsican. G. E. had no true idea at the time how dangerous the Corsican might be. The quiet times for Frankfurt and Hesse were now at an end. Stirred up by Napoleon's powerful genius Europe passed from one crisis to another and in such circumstances it was exceedingly difficult for William of Hesse to administer his enormous property with foresight and wisdom. He felt the need more and more of Mayor Emil's advice, so that Rothschild's journeys to Castle became more and more frequent. His eldest son had for some months been residing permanently in that town. The preference shown to the Frankfurt family aroused the envy and hatred of the Castle Jews against this outsider. They complained that not merely did he steal their best business, but he was not even subject to the nitrate and poll tax which other Jews had to pay. Mayor Emil did his utmost to evade such payments as far as possible, but in the end he was forced to pay some of these taxes. In August, 1803, he found it necessary to apply to the elector for a letter of protection in Castle for himself and his sons, so that, although resident in Frankfurt, he should enjoy the same rights as the protected Jews of Castle. This would certainly entail obligations as well. His request was granted on payment of 400 Reichsdollar, but the document was not completed, possibly in accordance with Mayor Emil's own wishes, for he would then have been liable to pay taxes in Castle also. The Castle Jews, however, soon got wind of this maneuver, and in the end Mayor Emil was required to state in whose name he wished the letter of protection made out, whereupon he wrote the following letter to the elector. Most gracious elector, most excellent prince and lord. Your Excellency has most graciously deigned to grant that in return for the payment of 100 florins I should be exempt from night rate, and that on the payment of 400 florins one of my sons or I should be admitted to protection. I am now required to state in whose name the letter of protection should be made out, 
and this is causing me great difficulty, since the son for whom I had intended taking it out has been settled for some time with another of my sons in London, and is engaged in doing business with him there. I have therefore decided to take out the protection for myself, if I may be most graciously permitted to pay an annual amount similar to that paid by other Jews not residing in the town, as I only do business here, and could do most of it quite as well from another place. As I have now held the office of Crown Agent for over forty years, your Electoral Highness having even in my youth shown me such gracious condescension, so I hope now too, to receive your most gracious consent, and remain with deepest respect, your Electoral Highness my most gracious Prince and Lord's most obedient servant, Mayor Emil Rothschild. Castle, April 21, 1805. This personal request, sent in by Mayor Rothschild in rather inferior German, provoked a certain amount of amusement at the Electoral Court. Mayor Amel was informed that his request could not be granted unless he moved to Castle with all his property. And that naturally he was not prepared to do. In the end the letter of protection was made out in the name of Amel Mayor Rothschild, his eldest son. Although Mayor Amel had to fight for his position in Castle, his prestige at Frankfurt rose, on account of his connection with the Hessian ruler, which was now becoming generally known. This was made manifest in various ways. When shops were put up to auction in the electoral courtyard, to which Jews, even resident Jews, were not admitted, an exception was made in favor of Mayor Amol. One of the shops was definitely excluded from the auction and reserved for Rothschild. It is possible that ready money was a factor, as well as his prestige in this matter. This period saw the conclusion of the two last, and by far the most substantial Danish loans, of 700,000 and 600,000 talos. In these transactions too, Loyettes played a part of some importance. In spite of very friendly business relations, he was still somewhat reserved in his attitude toward the Rothschild family. Whilst in talking to his friends he often declared that he had found Herr Rothschild always to be exceedingly prompt and businesslike and worthy of the most complete confidence, yet he felt that where such large amounts were at stake, one ought to be very cautious, even in dealing with Rothschild. The atmosphere then was full of suspicion, all the more so because the political barometer in Europe pointed to stormy times, and the capitalists were exceedingly uneasy as to the possible fate of their wealth. Bonaparte had already cast aside his mask and was boldly grasping at the imperial purple. Toward the end of the summer of 1804 the whole of France was echoing with the shout Vive l'Empire. The prestige of the German imperial system was suffering a corresponding decline, an obvious symptom of which was the proclamation on August 10, 1804, of Francis II as Emperor of Austria. Moreover, September, 1804, already saw Napoleon touring the newly won Rhine provinces. He appeared in full splendor and magnificence at Aix-la-Chapel and Mainz as if he were indeed the successor of Charles the Great. It was on this occasion that, with the assistance of the Mainz electoral High Chancellor, Dahlberg, he laid the foundations of that union of German princes which was to be known as the Confederation of the Rhine. Napoleon was already adopting the role of their protector, and invited William of Hesse to to Mainz, an invitation which was exceedingly suggestive of a command to come and do homage. The elector pleaded a sudden attack, of gout. Napoleon replied coldly. He was still polite, but he swore that William should pay for having failed immediately to adhere to the confederation which was being formed under Napoleon's protection. The French ambassador at Castle had uttered the menacing words, when he heard that the prince was not going to Mainz, on an ugly pa, on an ugly rien. 6. The Elector of Hesse was left feeling rather uncomfortable, and he secretly threw out cautious feelers toward England and Austria, Austria was already showing a marked inclination to side against France. The occasion of the Emperor Francis assuming the imperial title connected with his Austrian hereditary territories, afforded him an opportunity of expressing his most sincere and devoted good wishes to the most excellent, puissant and invincible Roman Emperor and Most Gracious Lord Seven for the continuous welfare of the sacred person of His Imperial Majesty and for the ever-increasing glory of the All-Highest Imperial House. His pen was jogged by need he felt for powerful support, 
and incidentally the letter was to serve the purpose of reminding the emperor of a request which the writer had made on November 22, 1804, and which so far had not been granted. The elector's first favorite, the apothecary's daughter Ritha, whom the emperor had raised to the rank of Frau von Leidenthal, and who was ancestress of the Hainaus, was now out of favor, since she had preferred a young subaltern to the aged Landgrave. For over a year her place had been occupied by Caroline von Schlotheim, the beautiful daughter of a Russian officer whom the emperor had been asked to create Countess von Hessenstein. In May, 1805, Austria finally joined the coalition against Napoleon. Napoleon gave up his idea of landing in the British Isles, and concentrated on Austria. This resulted in great shortage of money, for the Austrian treasury had heavy burdens to bear from former wars. Coin was scarce and paper money much depreciated. It was therefore decided that the interest on loans should not, as had hitherto been the practice, be payable in hard cash in all the principal exchanges in Europe, but should be payable in paper in Vienna only. This was hard for the elector personally, as he had advanced a million and a half gulden to the Emperor Francis. And he at once begged that an exception might be made in his favor since ill disposed persons had suggested to him that the Austrian state was going to go bankrupt, as far as all external debts were concerned. The imperial ambassador Baron von Wessenberg, naturally wishing to turn the general situation to account, sent this request forward under cover of a private dispatch of his own in which he wrote Since avarice is the elector's great weakness, it might be possible, should you wish to do so to obtain a still greater loan from him if you agreed that interest in future should be payable in cash. He would be more likely to fall in with such a suggestion if His Imperial Majesty would grant Frau von Schlotheim the title of Countess of Hessenstein, without payment. The granting of this request would particularly delight the elector. Nine in the second particular his wishes were granted, but it was not possible to make an exception in the matter of the interest charges. However, both Vienna and London endeavoured to secure the elector's accession to the Confederation, and he replied to these overtures with demands for subsidies. Yet he was hard put to it to find investments for all the money that he had at his disposal, and as late as December 2, 1805, he had lent 10 million thalers to Prussia. He had hoped that the Austro Russo English war against Napoleon would end in victory. But Austerlitz put a speedy end to such hopes. During the war, England sent financial assistance to Austria in the shape of a monthly payment of a third of a million pounds in cash, which was sent to Austria by the most difficult and circuitous routes. The Rothschild method of transferring large sums of money was as yet unknown, and the only method in use was the dangerous one of sending actual bullion by road. A consignment of money was actually on the way when Austerlitz was being fought, and, in fear of a defeat, Orders were issued from Imperial headquarters instructing this consignment to be diverted in a wide circuit through Galicia and the Carpathians. The war complications in which Europe was involved forced almost all states, whether they wished to or not, to take sides. The elector of Hesse characteristically wished to attach himself to the party out of which he could make the greatest profit. As Prussia was now also being drawn into conflict with Napoleon, she attempted to draw the elector in on her side. On the other hand, the French court gave him to understand that substantial advantages would be gained by the electorate if he kept himself completely free from Prussian influence. This suggestion was unpleasantly underlined by the gathering of bodies of French troops in the neighborhood of Hesse. The elector bargained with everybody and secured from Paris accessions of territory and the incorporation of the town of Frankfurt within his domains. The only awkward point was that Napoleon demanded that the British ambassador, through whom the subsidy arrangements were carried on, should be sent home. And when the elector delayed about doing this, Napoleon expressed his displeasure in no uncertain language, until the elector gave way, and sent the ambassador away. Annoyed at France's threatening attitude the Hessian ruler again endeavoured to attach himself to Prussia. Then, on July 12, 1806, the document regarding the Confederation of the Rhine was published, through which Napoleon, with the assistance of Prince Theodore von Dolberg, Electoral High Chancellor, won sixteen German states by promising them separation from the German Empire. As a counterblast to this, 
Prussia attempted to bring about a union of the princes of northern Germany, and to gain the support of the Elector of Hesse by offering him the prospect of an accession of territory and the dignity of kingship which he so much desired. These moves were followed by threats and promises on the side of France. The attitude of the Elector remained undefined. He now thought it best to preserve the appearance of neutrality until the actual outbreak of war, and then simply to join the side which was winning, although a signed, if not ratified, treaty with Prussia was in existence. He had, however, not reckoned sufficiently with the forceful personality of Napoleon. It was impossible to conduct a nebulous diplomacy with such a man. He had long been tired of the vacillating attitude of Hesse. A state of war was declared in early October, 1806. On the 14th of that month, Prussia was decisively beaten through Napoleon's lightning advance at Jena and Auerstadt. Napoleon now scorned Hessian neutrality. He ordered that Kassel and Hesse should be occupied, and that unless the elector and the crown prince left they should be made prisoners of war as Prussian field marshals. You will, commanded Napoleon, seal up all treasuries and stores and appoint General Lagrange as governor of the country. You will raise taxes and pronounce judgments in my name. Secrecy and speed will be the means through which you will ensure complete success. My object is to remove the House of HCSSE Castle from rulership and to strike it out of the list of powers. At Frankfurt, Mayor Emil Rothschild had been watching the precipitate development of events with terror. And his son Emil, at Castle, as well as he himself at Frankfurt, took all possible measures to prevent themselves and the elector from suffering too great financial loss. Business had just been going so exceedingly well. The firm of Bethman, which had felt that it was being driven into the background, and had just been making strenuous efforts to get a share in the elector's loan business with Denmark, was forced to withdraw from the contest, on account of the political conditions and the resulting shortage of money, and thereby left the way open to Rothschild, who still had resources available. In the meantime Loyettes in Hamburg had definitely decided in Rothschild's favor. On July 2, 1806, he wrote himself to Budarus to say that he would stand by their good friend Rothschild as far as he could, saying, I hope that in the end people will realize that he is a good fellow who deserves to be respected. The envious may say what they like against him. In spite of all that Rothschild had hitherto done in the service of the elector, he had not won his confidence to the extent of being called in in a matter which had become pressing on account of the developing military situation. For although the elector continued to hope that the notices naively posted on the roads leading to Hesse, bearing the words Pays Neutre would be respected, he was sufficiently concerned for the safety of his treasures to send away and conceal his more valuable possessions. But it was no light task to deal with the extensive banking accounts of the electoral loan office, and with his vast accumulations of treasure, and after several months the work was still far from complete. There being no distinction between the treasury and the prince's private purse, it was necessary to get out of the way, not only his own valuables, but also the cabinet, or and chancery cash records, for a period covering several decades. For so the books of his financial administration were called, in order to make it impossible to examine into the state of his affairs. There were large volumes of these records, representing vast sums. In the war chest alone there was over 21 million dollars, 16 millions of which were out on loan in various places, and bringing an interest to the tune of many thousands of dollars. All this had to be concealed as far as possible, and this business was done by trusty officials, under the guidance of Budarus. But there is nothing to show that any of the Rothschilds were employed in the long-continued work of transport and concealment. Time was pressing. Some of the things were sent to Denmark. But it was impossible to get everything out of the country, and to have done so would have attracted too much attention. So the elector, who gave the closest personal attention to the plans for ensuring the safety of his possessions, decided that the most precious articles should be buried within the walls of three of his castles. Under the stairs of the castle of Wilhelmshu were hidden twenty-four chests containing silver and mortgage documents to the value of one and a half million gulden, amongst which were certain Rothschild debentures, while twenty-four chests with cash vouchers and certain valuable volumes from the library were concealed in the walls under the roof. A similar number of chests were concealed in the picturesque castle of Lewenberg, 
built in the William Shue Park, while further treasures were conveyed in 47 chests to the Sababurg, situated in a remote forest. The Elector had originally intended to send the last consignment down the Weser to England, but he and the ship owner disagreed over a matter of 50 thalers and so they were not sent away. It was impossible to carry through such measures in secrecy, as too many persons were involved in the transaction. And long before the French invaded the country, there was general alarm throughout the district, because the Elector was said to be hiding all his treasures. Meanwhile Napoleon's commands were being carried out. French troops, coming from Frankfurt, were already encamped on the night of October on the heights surrounding Castle. The Elector gazed anxiously from the windows of his castle at the enemy's campfires, and sent adjutant after adjutant to Mortier, the French marshal. In due course the French envoy was announced, and brought an ultimatum from Napoleon, significantly addressed, to the Elector of Hesse Castle, Field Marshal in the service of Prussia. In short, biting sentences William's double game was exposed, and the occupation of the country and the disarmament of its inhabitants was proclaimed. The Elector immediately decided to throw in his lot with Napoleon and to join the Confederation of the Rhine. But it was too late. Marshal Mortier would no longer listen to the Elector's messengers. The Elector realized that there was nothing for him but flight. In the few hours before the French entered the country he would have to move as many of his remaining possessions as he could, and make the more urgent dispositions regarding outstanding accounts. William gave Buda as power of attorney to receive the interest payments due from the Emperor Francis in Vienna. And Buda as transferred this power of attorney to Rothschild, who proceeded to collect these payments for the elector, through a business friend in Vienna, the banker Frank. Besides this, Buderus that night brought two chests containing securities and statements of accounts to the house of the Austrian ambassador at Kassel, Baron von Wessenberg, and begged him to take charge of them. In addition, a member of the elector's bodyguard roused the ambassador in the middle of the night to give him five envelopes containing one and a half million thalers in valid bills of exchange and coupons, as well as the elector's compromising correspondence with Prussia and England. He also gave him a casket of jewels requesting that the ambassador deal with these things as he would for a friend. Baron von Wessenberg felt extremely uncomfortable. His position as ambassador of a neutral power was being seriously compromised, but he was fortunately able to entrust the money to a chamberlain of his acquaintance, who was travelling to Hanover that night. The letters, however, were of such a compromising nature that he burned them in terror. He had dealt with everything excepting the jewels, when the trumpets and marching songs of the French invading troops were heard in the morning. A few minutes earlier the Elector had left the town with his son in a travelling coach and six. After having been held up by French troops at one gate, he escaped by another, and drove without stopping through Hameln and Altona, to Rheinsberg and Schleswig. Having entered Kassel, Marshal Mortier immediately began to carry out all Napoleon's instructions, and also commandeered all the electoral monies and possessions, even including the stables and the court furniture. He took over the electoral rooms in the castle for his own personal use, and the electoral flunkies as his personal servants. He did not molest the elector's consort, and Wessenberg succeeded in sending her the jewels, which she sewed into her garments and those of her servants. Buderus felt that things might get rather warm for him, and he left Castle disguised as an apprentice, with a knapsack on his back, to follow his master into exile. His despairing family stayed behind. While these events were taking place, neither Mayor Emil Rothschild nor either of his sons seems to have been at Castle. They had long realized that the attitude of the French toward the Elector was critical, and that their relations with him might get them into trouble. Frankfurt, too, had been occupied by the French, and the headquarters of the firm, their house and their whole property, were at the mercy of the enemy. In his heart Mayor Emil remained loyal to the Elector, and saw that the position arising out of the French invasion and the flight of the Elector was one in which he could still be of great service to him. He presumably came quite rightly to the conclusion, that it was in the Elector's own interest that he should stay away at this critical period, so that he might, if possible, carry on the elector's business behind the backs of the French. In following his natural inclinations, and not compromising himself in the eyes of the French, 
and in keeping out of the way of these dangerous companions as far as possible, he was also following the course of the greatest practical utility. Even if Mayor Amel or one of his sons had actually been in castle, the monies entrusted to Baron von Wessenberg would not have been placed in their keeping. They were, as yet, far from enjoying such a degree of confidence. Indeed, the ambassador actually stated in his report to Vienna at the time that the elector had sent the things to him because of lack of confidence in his business agents. The French immediately instituted investigations to discover where the elector had hidden his wealth. Napoleon had received news at Berlin of the occurrences at Kassel. At four o'clock on the morning of November 5, 1806, he sent the following orders to Lagrange, have all the artillery, ordnance stores, furniture, statues and other articles in the palace of the court brought to Mainz. Proclaim that this prince may no longer rule. I shall not continue to suffer a hostile prince on my boundaries, especially one who is practically a Prussian, not to say an Englishman, and who sells his subjects. You must completely disarm the inhabitants, and authorize an intendant to seize the prince's revenue. In general you may treat the country mercifully, but if there is any sign of insurrection anywhere, you must make a terrible example. Let yourself be guided by the principle that I wish to see the House of Hesse, whose existence on the Rhine cannot be reconciled with the safety of France, permanently removed from power. Such were Napoleon's feelings toward the elector. The latter sent messenger after messenger, and letter upon letter to Napoleon, but the emperor refused to answer. On the 1st of November, 1806, William of Hesse arrived at his destination, the castle at Gottorp, near Schleswig, belonging to his brother, who had also married a Danish princess. A whole crowd of exile princelings from small German states was gathered there. They had all been suddenly wrenched from a comfortable and careless existence, and were suffering acutely, especially from financial distress. We are in the greatest misery here, wrote Budarus to London, on November 17, 1806. Please help us to get some money soon, because we do not know what we shall do otherwise, as we are not getting a farthing from Castle. God, how things have changed! Meanwhile the French occupied Hamburg and advanced unpleasantly close to the elector's place of refuge. He became exceedingly nervous and excited, and feared that he might yet fall into the hands of the French, with all the belongings that he had rescued. His possessions were all packed in chests, ready for further transport. He once got into such a state of panic that he wanted to send Buddha straight off into the blue with as many valuables and securities as possible, leaving it to him to make such provision as he could for their safe custody. However, the outlook became less menacing. The French did yet come to Schleswig for the time being, and the elector gradually recovered his composure. Meanwhile Lagrange was ruthlessly executing Napoleon's severe commands at Kassel. Even Wessenberg, suspected of concealing electoral treasure, was placed temporarily under arrest. Gradually all the treasures that had been concealed in the castle, including the gold and silver plate, the antiques, the whole collection of coins and medals to which Rothschild had contributed so many valuable specimens, and also the innumerable chests containing deeds and securities, were discovered. The elector might well regret that for the sake of fifty thalers, he had failed to have the silver carried down the river. All his splendid silver was sent to mines to be melted down. Dazzled by the vast extent of the riches that were being brought to light, Lagrange was moved to take steps to feather his own nest. Although his imperial master well knew that the elector was rich, he could hardly expect his wealth to be as extensive as actually proved to be the case. Lagrange reported to Napoleon that the property discovered was only worth 11 million thalers, which of course was not remotely in accordance with the facts. And in return for a douceur of 260,000 francs in cash, he returned to the Hessian officials 42 of the chests, including almost all those that contained securities and title deeds. Running great dangers, a brave electoral captain brought the chests into safety, and conveyed 19 of them to Frankfurt, where they were stored, not with Mayor Emil Rothschild, but in the warehouse of Prey and Jordis, in whose extensive vault they could be concealed without attracting attention. For an additional 800,000 livres paid to himself and the intendant, the dishonest governor promised to return other papers too, and not to carry out any further investigation. 
thereby countless chests were released, which were distributed amongst various trusted persons, for safe keeping. Four of these chests, containing papers of the Privy Council, found their way to Mayor Emil Rothschild's house with the Green Shield in the Jewish Quarter, during the Spring Fair of 1807. This was the only part played by the House of Rothschild in the actual saving of the electoral treasures. Mayor Emil Rothschild hid these chests, having left one of them for a time with his son-in-law Moses Worms, in the cellar of his house. In case of emergency he could have recourse to a separate cellar behind the house and under the courtyard, the approach to the cellar from the house cellar being very easy to conceal. The courtyard cellar, too, was connected by a secret passage with the neighboring house. The persecution of the Frankfurt Jews in earlier times, had led to many such secret refuges being constructed. In this case it was therefore reasonable to assume that if the house were searched by foreigners like the French, the cellar under the courtyard would not be discovered at all, and that even if it were discovered there was a good chance of getting its contents into the next house. In the meantime political changes had occurred which put an end to the political independence of Frankfurt. Karl von Dolberg, who had collaborated with Talleyrand in the creation of the Confederation of the Rhine, was nominated primate of the Confederation on June 12, 1806, and by a decree of Napoleon was granted the city of Frankfurt and the surrounding territory as his residence. This was a fact of much importance, both to the elector and to his devoted servants the Rothschild family, for Dahlberg was particularly well disposed to the elector and to his administrator Buderus on account of his business dealings with them in earlier times. And, although he was an archbishop and a strict Catholic, he was known to be tolerant in his religious views. The incorporation of Frankfurt in the Confederation of the Rhine put an end to its constitution as a state of the empire. And the Jews, who had hitherto been subjected to oppression by the hostile patrician families who had controlled the Senate, now hoped for the abolition of all those restrictions prohibitions and special laws under which they had suffered for centuries. Under the new regime life in the great commercial city took on an entirely different complexion. It had to be ordered in accordance with the wishes, or rather the commands, of the French. This was especially the case when Napoleon, in order to deal a deadly blow at the arch-enemy England, declared the continental blockade whereby all commerce and communication by letter or otherwise with England was prohibited as that country was practically the only emporium for such indispensable colonial produce as coffee, sugar, and tobacco, the prices of these articles rose enormously, and a clever merchant could make large profits through timely purchases or by smuggling goods through Holland and the harbours of North Germany. In spite of the control exercised by France over the trade of Frankfurt, Mayor Emil and his son contrived, with the assistance of Nathan in England, to make a good deal of money in this way. There were certainly risks attached to this form of commerce, for under Article 5 of the Continental Blockade, all goods of English origin were declared lawful prize. With the passage of time this kind of business became more restricted, for as Napoleon's power increased he was able to make the control more effective. Mayor Emil well knew that in spite of his flight and the loss of property which he had suffered at the hands of the French, the elector was still in possession of very considerable resources. There was. Moreover, always the possibility of a sudden change in Napoleon's fantastic career, and such an event would immediately alter the whole situation. He therefore adhered to his policy of ingratiating himself to the best of his ability with Napoleon's nominee, the new Lord of Frankfurt, while he continued faithfully to serve the elector in secret. For his purpose it was necessary that he should remain in constant communication with him. On 15 December, 1806, Mayor Emil sent an account to Schleswig of his earlier sales of London bills of exchange, and reported that the other bills which he held were unsaleable at the moment. Although the servile script was full of protestations of groveling humility, and was composed in the illiterate style and full of the spelling mistakes of the old Mayor Emil, it revealed a certain pride, for Father Rothschild made considerable play with the good relations which he had established with Dolberg. Rothschild reported with pride that he had influenced Dahlberg in favour of the elector, and had induced the new Lord of Frankfurt to intercede with the Emperor and Empress of France on the elector's behalf. He begged to state, however, that Dahlberg advised that the elector should not stand so much upon his rights, but should adopt towards Napoleon the attitude of a humble petitioner. 
Mayor Amel concluded by assuring the elector of his unswerving loyalty and devotion, and declared that he hoped, through his influence with Dolberg, substantially to reduce the war contribution of 1 million. 300,000 thalers imposed by Napoleon upon the elector personally. He also asserted that Dahlberg had commended him to all the French marshals and ministers. Although this letter of Mayor Amel's was written in a boastful vein, and although he exaggerated his influence, as in point of fact he did not succeed in getting the levy reduced, incidentally, the elector got the levy transferred to the estates of the realm of Hesse, yet the report contained an element of truth. It was certainly most remarkable that the Archbishop and Lord of the Confederation of the Rhine, who ruled over sixteen German princes, and stood so high in Napoleon's favour, should have shown so much goodwill to the Jew Mayor Emil Rothschild of Frankfurt, who, although now a rich man, had no claim to move in high and influential circles. There appear to have been financial reasons for this relationship, and it no doubt originated in loans granted by Rothschild. When the elector had come to feel reasonably secure in his new place of refuge in Schleswig, he devoted himself again to his favorite hobby, and tried to set in order his chaotic possessions. Buderus had control of this work at every point. He had left Schleswig some time before and returned to Hanau, where he was occupied in calling in debts due to the elector, before they could accrue to the French. There was, for instance, the claim on Prince von Ziel Wurzch, which was in great danger of being lost. Buderus, however, succeeded in saving this item, and in his report he referred with emphasis to the assistance granted by Rothschild, mentioning his name repeatedly. I owe it entirely to the efforts of the Crown agent Rothschild, he wrote to his master on March 8, 1807, that I am still not entirely without hope. And he has undertaken to arrange an interview between myself and the Wurzch Chancellor in a place which he will select. The eldest son of the princely debtor attended this conference himself, and it resulted in the repayment to Buderus of the outstanding amount, which Buderus ascribed to the fact that Rothschild had used his influence to such good effect with the advisers and officials of the prince. He added, as especially illustrating Rothschild's trustworthiness, that the French in Castle had offered to pay Rothschild 20 to 25 percent of the amount at issue, if he would assist in diverting this debt of 9,000 gulden in accordance with Napoleon's orders. Your Electoral Highness, the letter continued, may certainly deign most graciously to realize, the labor involved in saving this amount in the most dangerous circumstances. Besides Buderus, Lenf at Kassel, Loyets at Hamburg, and the war commissioners, paymasters and crown agents such as Mayor Emil and his sons were looking after the financial interests of the elector. Frankfurt is the center point of all my business, Buderus, who directed all the operations, wrote to the elector. To an ever-increasing degree Buderus was entrusting the elector's business to the Rothschild family. Indeed he was now employing them almost exclusively. They looked fte or the correspondence with Kassel, with the elector, and with laureates at Hamburg, pseudonyms being employed for the more important persons and transactions. Thus the elector was known as the principal, or Herr von Goldstein. The stocks in England were known as stockfish. Rothschild himself was called Arnoldi in these letters. Mayor Emil was often sent to the elector by Buderus to convey accounts or other information. These seven-day journeys in bad coaches over rough roads, with a constant risk of falling into the hands of the enemy, with the letters with which he had been entrusted, came to be felt as exceedingly burdensome by Mayor Emil in the course of time. He was not more than sixty-four years old but his health had latterly suffered from the extraordinary demands made upon the chief of the extensive business house. Henceforth he generally left these journeys as to the north to his son Kuhlmann, or Karl, as his two eldest sons, Emil and Solomon, were fully occupied at the head office in Frankfurt. These journeys had now to be very frequently undertaken because Napoleon had entered upon a definite offensive against the elector's property. And this called for countermeasures of all kinds, from the elector's loyal adherents. In accordance with Napoleon's instructions, the French attempted, as they had already done in the case of Prince von Ziel Wurzch, to divert the monies lent by the elector in his own country to the French treasury, by offering substantial discounts on the amount due. It is true that Lagrange had valued these amounts at only 4 million thalers, the equivalent of 16 million francs, 
but actually they amounted to about 16 million thalers. One can therefore readily imagine the dismay which the action of the French occasioned the elector. A large number of princes belonging to the Confederation of the Rhine, who owed him money, took advantage of the opportunity of settling their debts at a reduction. On Rothschild's advice, the elector implored the Emperor Francis at Vienna on no account to pay to the French either the capital sum or the interest due in respect of the million and a half gulden which he had borrowed from the elector. All the efforts to cause Napoleon to change his attitude failed. And meanwhile the situation at Gotthorp had become impossible. The elector had arranged for his favourite mistress Schlotheim to join him, and his host's wife, who was a sister of the elector's consort, was afraid of causing pain to the latter if she associated with the Schlotheim. Also the collapse of a rising in Hesse deprived him of a last hope. Fools! exclaimed Lagrange in a proclamation to the Hessians on 18 February, 1807. Count no longer upon your prince. He and his house have ceased to rule. Whoever resists will be shot. William in the meantime had migrated to Rendsburg, and later to Schlossishoe. In moving language he wrote to the King of Prussia and to the Emperor of Austria. To the former he wrote, I have now been living here for four months, groaning under the weight of intolerable grief, and filled, with deep concern for the many bitter experiences through which your Majesty is passing, and which affect me even more than my own misfortunes. I have had to watch the land of my fathers suffering an arbitrary rule, and my private property being squandered, and to see my loyal subjects suffering and being gradually reduced to beggary, if they are not speedily succoured. It is indeed hard, Your Royal Majesty, to have to endure such experiences, and doubly hard when one is conscious that one has always acted in a manner which one could justify before God and men. His letter to the Emperor of Austria was written in exactly the same vein. In the opening sentence the epi that most invincible was on this occasion, in view of the Battle of Austerlitz, not added to those of most excellent, and most powerful. He begged in the strongest terms, for the Emperor's help and support. These letters were written after the Elector's efforts to conciliate Napoleon had merely resulted in the Emperor of France showing his personal contempt and aversion more clearly than ever. William of Hesse's attitude continued to be completely unreliable and vacillating as far as everybody was concerned. At the same time that he was overwhelming Napoleon with supplications, he was negotiating with England for landing on the coast for combined action against the French. But in England, his overtures to Napoleon were known. He was no longer trusted, and the electoral funds invested in that country were sequestrated, so that although he received the interest, he had no power to dispose of the capital. All these things had not helped to improve the elector's temper. Prince Wittgenstein, who frequently had occasion to visit him in exile on behalf of the Prussian government, wrote, Personal association with him is indescribably unpleasant. The greatest patience is required in order to put up with his endless complaints and sudden outbursts. Budderus and Mayor Emil Rothschild were soon to suffer in the same way. Rothschild had latterly been collecting and accounting for the interest on the English and Danish loans due to the elector. As this had not been settled by the elector personally, he complained of the arrangement. He again became suspicious, and suddenly required that Budderus should not allow this money to pass through Rothschild's hands, but that it should be paid direct into the reserve treasury at Isho, an arrangement which was more difficult to carry out. This was galling both for Budderus and for Mayor Emil Rothschild, who was just endeavouring through Dahlberg's good offices to buy back the elector's coin collection, containing so many gold and silver specimens of priceless value, which had been carried off to Paris. The following events did not improve the elector's temper. By offering the Tsar the prospect of sharing the work dominion with himself, Napoleon had in the Treaty of Tilsit reaped the fruits of his campaign against Prussia. The result was that Hesse was allotted to the newly created Kingdom of Westphalia, and Napoleon's brother Jerome pitched his tent in William's residence at Castle. The exiled elector was filled with rage and indignation, and his tendency to behave unjustly to those about him became more marked. When Budderus was again staying with his master at his hoe, and spoke of Rothschild and the services that he had rendered, the elector indicated that he noted the special favour shown to Rothschild with surprise, as after all, he was a Jew of very obscure antecedents, 
and expressed his concern to find Buddha as employing him, as he had lately been doing, to the exclusion of almost everybody else, in the most important financial transactions. Buddha declared himself strongly in reply. He pointed out how promptly Rothschild had always paid, especially in the case of the monies from London, and emphasized the skill with which Rothschild had succeeded in concealing from the French his English dealings on behalf of the elector. He related how French officials in Frankfurt had recently been instructed to carry out investigations at Mayor Emil Rothschild's, in order to ascertain whether he did not collect English monies for the elector and how Mayor Emil had immediately produced his books, an inspection of which had revealed absolutely nothing of this matter. This fact proved that even then Mayor Emil was keeping two sets of books, one of which was suitable for inspection by the various authorities and tax collectors, the other containing the record of the more secret and profitable transactions. Buddha has pointed out that Beth Mann, in view of his standing as a Frankfurt patrician, and as the head of a firm that was centuries old, could not so suitably be employed in transactions which in the difficult political conditions of the time could not bear the light of day. He added that Bethman's financial resources had given out in connection with the Danish loan in 1806, and that Rothschild far surpassed him in determination and energy. He also suggested that Rothschild had given greater proof of loyalty, for they had hardly heard anything of Bethman's since the elector had gone into exile whereas Mayor Emil was constantly concerning himself with the elector's interests, and also, when necessary, coming personally to Schleswig, or sending one of his sons. Buderus's representations succeeded finally in allaying this bout of suspicion against the Rothschild family, with whom he had now established very close personal relations. Through the efforts of the administrator of the elector's estates, all the other bankers were gradually forced into the background, Rothschild taking their place. From this time onwards he enjoyed the elector's confidence as far as such a thing was possible, and we find Mayor Emil becoming, not only William's principal banker, but also his confidential adviser in various difficult matters. As his health no longer permitted him to do full justice to the strenuous requirements of the elector's service, he placed one of his sons at the elector's disposal when necessary. Up to this time the elector had turned down the various proposals regarding the collection of interest and the investment of capital that Nathan had made to him from London. As late as June, 1807, he actually instructed his charge d'affaires in London to vouchsafe no reply whatever if Nathan should venture again to inquire as to the elector's financial affairs. In this matter too, he was slowly and completely to change his attitude, without any disadvantage to himself. Everybody who possibly could was borrowing money from the elector, for the German sovereigns, and not least, the King of Prussia, was suffering from extreme shortage of money after Napoleon's victorious march through their country, owing to the heavy war expenses and the subsidies which he imposed. Prince Wittgenstein repeatedly urged the King of Prussia to be very cordial to the elector, and as soon as it should be practicable to invite him to live in Berlin because it might then perhaps be possible to persuade him to grant a loan. The invitation was actually sent, but the king had then himself been obliged to flee from his capital, and was suffering the most grievous misfortunes, so that Berlin was out of the question. Meanwhile Denmark had also been forced by Napoleon to give up her neutrality. The French invaded the dukedoms and the Danish royal house found the presence of the elector, who was such a thorn in Napoleon's side, most embarrassing. In these circumstances, the refugee was in constant danger of being discovered and taken prisoner. Jerome was ruling in Hesse, and it was of little use to the elector that Lagrange's double dealing was brought to light, and the general dismissed. In spite of an invitation from the Prince of Wales, William did not wish to go to England, since that would have meant a final breach with the powerful usurper, for the elector continued to cherish an unreasonable hope of Napoleon's forgiveness. There was still Austria. In his last letter the Emperor Francis had expressed his most heartfelt sympathy in these sad circumstances, with the hope that he might be of assistance to him. The elector accordingly asked for asylum in Austrian territory, and decided to continue his flight to Bohemia, stopping first at Carlsbad. He did not part with his treasures, but took with him all the valuables and papers which had been saved, including a chest full of deeds which Mayor Emil had proposed to bring on afterwards from Hamburg. The travellers were carefully disguised on their journey. 
in one place where there were French troops they nearly lost their most valuable belongings, as the wheels of the carriage in which they were packed broke in the marketplace, and they were forced to transfer them to another vehicle. Fortunately nobody guessed what the bales contained. The journey proceeded without further mishap. And on July 28, 1808, the elector arrived at Carlsbad, where he awaited the emperor's decision as to his final place of abode. Meanwhile Mayor Emil and his son were carrying on their business at Frankfurt and developing the trading as well as the purely financial side of